Hello, guys. How are you guys doing? I see it says live there. So if you guys can see this and hear this, uh, write a comment so Vadim can read it and let me know. There we go. I see some people coming through. What's up, guys? Thank you for joining us. So I've only done a few of these, so I'm going to try to uh, have this run smoothly. So I see 80 people on. Thank you guys for joining. What's up, everybody? 95. Hello. That is awesome. Uh, so I think I'm going to open up a little uh, the chat box. And uh, before we get started, I'll just say hi to some of you guys. And the way we're going to do this, actually, I'll mention that in a second. I want a little bit more people to get on here if people are going to be people are going to be on. So if we're going to be doing more of this in the future, uh, the plan is to um, to get a different setup, maybe a multi-camera setup, higher quality, better audio with XLR mics, stuff like that. Max, ты по-русски понимаешь? Да, я по-русски понимаю. Привет. Um, yes, I do speak Russian. Uh, I don't have much of an accent, uh, but I do speak Russian. I do not do any of these videos in Russian because I don't understand a lot of the terms, and the audience in English is much higher, and I'm basically an American, so uh, that's why all these, uh, all these videos are in English. So uh, what's up, uh, Ron from Vancouver, from Argentina? That is so awesome, seeing people from all over the place. Let's see here. We have 137. Sounds good. The sound was good. The, hopefully the video quality is pretty good. We have uh, tons of lights. So the plan is right now I'm going to wait for a little bit more people to join in before we start the official video. This little beginning is going to get cut out. So we'll probably give it another minute or so before we start. But I'll pick up my laptop. It's what I'm recording on. So here we have an Aperture Softbox. Uh, well, this is a softbox with the Aperture. 120D, very bright. And then that's eight LED bulbs for the ceiling. A lot of light. We have a practical and then a hair light right there. So we're actually in my new office, which is in the house that I just moved into. I was renting an office, but we changed. Let me try to see. We'll set up something like this. Rule of thirds, right? So uh, we moved into a different uh, office, now out of a new house. I'm renting a much nicer, larger house. Before I had a smaller house and I was uh, renting a separate office. This is gonna give us a little bit more flexibility, but long term I wanna uh, build a separate shop and a really nice office setup. So um, I think that works for the actual the view. Let's see what other comments we have. Trade subs. Uh, you can't really trust it like a C100. Alex is asking if you can go from a C100 Mark II. Not as well. You should be looking at FS5 probably. Jason Vong is in the house. What's up, Jason Vong? Thanks for joining. I think uh, this, the view count isn't going up very much anymore, so I think we're going to start up here really soon. Uh, so if you guys have questions, you guys can ask. The way we're going to run this is um, I'm going to do it in a few different sections. I don't want this video being longer than 20 minutes so that it's watchable afterwards. I'm going to go over first photos, briefly touch on that, then uh, touch about we're going to go over like the strong points of the GH5, and then we're going to go over you know the pros of the A6500. And as I mentioned those pros, I'll kind of mention what the other camera does. In between the three different sections, there's going to be three different Q&A times. And uh, we're not going to answer a ton of questions, but Vadim's looking over your questions. So the best, uh, the best questions will be answered maybe two or three at a time between the little sections of, uh, of the video. So that's how we're going to run this. And if this works out well, we'll keep doing this in the future. If not, we'll try to see kind of what would work best for us. So 206 and... I'm going to look through the comments a little bit more here. It's so fun to, to talk to you guys and to hang out. 210, 212. Okay, I'll look through these comments a little bit more, and then we're going to um, start the video. Let me see. Photo Joseph, what's up? So we're doing the live stream. Photo Joseph live streams five days a week, which is crazy. I'm already seeing a lot of uh, – this is going to be so hard choosing – 
two or three questions between each section because there's so much uh, so much good uh, good questions. So, Vadim, we're going to choose yeah. questions that are related to the GH5 versus A6500. Okay. Um, or you know questions about the 6500 or about the GH5. I know there's a, I've seen some, seeing different questions already about computers, um, about different stuff like that. So uh, I can't really cover those because I want this to be relevant to the topic. So when people watch this video later, it'll still be interesting for them. Um, and then if you guys have other questions, we might do other live streams in the future about those kind of things. So 225, we're getting up there. Why do we have three dislikes? What's going on there? <laughs> but that's kind of normal. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, that was kind of the, the pre-show while we're, getting, we're seeing the viewers ramp up. I think we're about, to, about ready to start here. And uh, uh, once again, we're going to be doing three different sections. And then in between the little each section about the topic, we're going to be um, doing a short Q&A with questions that are relevant to this topic. So if you have a question you guys can ask, Vadim is looking over them and he's pasting them that I'm going to take a look at. So make sure it's relevant to the GH5, the A6500, or uh, you know, to both of those cameras. Those are the questions I'm going to talk about. So with that said, I'm going to ramp, ramp, back, up, ramp back, switch over, and I'm going to start this video. and. Uh, I'll just kind of mention some things that I already mentioned, and then that way people that watch this later with the, the intro cut out, they'll understand what's going on. All right. Hey, guys, it's Max. Welcome to our live stream video on the GH5 versus the A6500. Which camera is right for you? So this is a live stream. We have people watching right now, but most likely you're going to be watching this in the future on the YouTube channel. We're going to do this in a few different sections. We're going to talk about photos first. Then we're going to talk about uh, the pros and cons of each camera. And in between those, questions, those sections, we're going to have a Q&A time. So people that were asking questions, um, those are posted for me. I'm going to choose two to three questions between each little section, and those will get answered. So hopefully we get some good questions. So um, I've used the Panasonic's for a very long time for video work. I've also used Sony's not as long, but still a good amount of time. I've had a lot of different Sony cameras, so I have a good, a good amount of experience with both systems and then both cameras individually. So right now I own a 6300, 6500, and a GH5. So I would say I've used them well enough to be able to kind of do, do this topic. So uh, first off, let's talk about the size. So size-wise, there is a big difference. Now, neither of these cameras are really huge. They're both fairly compact, but the A6500 is really ridiculously small if you think about it. You have an APS-C size sensor with IBIS in something that is very small and very lightweight. The GH5 isn't large, but it is quite a bit larger when you're comparing them side by side and you're holding them in the hand. Now, there is advantages to both. If you like to travel, if you like to pack light, the A6500 is better in this regard because it's thinner, it's lighter, it's just smaller in each and every way, even though the sensor size is larger. But there is a downside with that. You don't have as much physical buttons, physical controls, so you end up having to go into menus more often, and it's a little bit more frustrating to use at times. So there's kind of a trade-off. The GH5, on the other hand, is really about the optimal, the most optimal size if you're, if you're trying to find a good balance. So the grip feels much better in hand because it's just larger, you have a much better hold, and there's a lot more physical buttons. I love that you have like a manual and autofocus switch that is so handy to have right there where your thumb lands. Uh, you have uh, like actual ISO button. You don't have to take your hands off the grip to touch that. So um, if you don't need a very compact camera, then the GH5 is really, really nice. But those times where you're trying to vlog, go out with the family, when I want to shoot photos, uh, shoot some video clips, um, or if I'm traveling, it is really nice to have something smaller. So I have the benefit of having both. A lot of people don't have that. So that, and if that is really important size-wise to you, I would kind of keep that in mind. For most people, I don't think the GH5 size is an issue, and it's more of a benefit. So um, let's see. We're going to answer. Let's do one question here. OK, so which one is the best as a first camera overall? Um, probably GH5. That's a very 
Okay, <laughs> you just deleted that question on there. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to answer what is the best because there's so much variables. That's why we're doing this kind of video. Let's move on to photos. So I'm gonna keep this section shorter because I am a bit biased, I will be honest. I like a larger sensor size and um, I like a compact camera. And if you're working in a lot of different conditions such as weddings, you oftentimes you have to raise up the ISO. You really don't have a choice, even if you have fast, fast glass. And in photos, I mean video as well, and I'll touch on that a little bit later, but uh, if you really want the most optimal quality, nice, sharp, detailed looking photos, you want to keep the ISO down. When you're forced to push it up, you lose, no, you lose detail, you gain noise. If you do noise reduction, it works well in software, but you do lose detail. So personally, I would choose um, the A6500 for photo work. Now, I'm kind of coming from the portrait wedding type of a background. I like to have a lot of bokeh, and you can achieve, achieve that with the GH5 if you're very careful with your lens selection, but it's more difficult. So Panasonic does have that noct Noctricon, I'm pronouncing it totally wrong, basically the 42.5 f1.2. You can get some really nice bokeh. It's a very nice and sharp lens, but the price, it is very expensive. I think the MSRP is about $1,600. Uh, where on the Sony side, because you have that larger sensor, you can choose less expensive lenses, um, such as even the 50mm 1.8 OSS, I think it's about $300, and I, I picked mine up for $200 used. It's not as sharp, but it's still fairly sharp, and uh, because it doesn't need to be 1.2 because the sensor is larger. So you get similar bokeh, similar out of focus, kind of uh, subject background separation for a lot less money. So that definitely comes into play. Um, so you're able to get uh, better low light and you don't have to worry about your ISOs as much. It is slightly higher megapixels. So I I would kind of push you towards the A6500 if you're strictly looking at photos. Doesn't mean you can't get good results with the GH5. I've seen great images with the GH4, but you have to be more careful with your lens selection, with your lighting, uh, to get really awesome results. Now, uh, the next thing is speed booster. I do want to mention that before I ask any more questions or answer any more questions. You can put a speed booster on the GH5. That effectively makes it a Super 35 sensor. You gain back the difference in kind of sensor size in, in terms of like low light or high ISO. You get more depth of field from it, but you do have drawbacks. So your autofocusing is not going to be as fast as using native lenses and also the cost. So if you're looking at a $2,000 camera body and you're adding on another $600, $650 adapter and then uh, lenses for that, that really you know kicks up the price and you're getting close to like full frame territory of like a, you know, A7S. I think you can buy A7S II for probably around $2,600. So that's kind of the price point you're looking at. So speed boosters are great. When I bought my GH4s when those came out, I was using speed boosters. But then you have to figure in how much extra money you're spending on the adapters and what kind of drawbacks come in. So uh, for like studio use, it's really nice. You can get that extra depth of field, but um, you have kind of those drawbacks. So I, I wanted to mention that speed booster because I know some people are going to be bringing that up. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few more questions. Um, let's see here. Do you want me to delete any? Um, I'll, I'll answer some and then you can delete them. So which camera seems to handle attachments like speed boosters better? GH5 or A6500? I'm interested in using the 18 to 35. Well, the GH5 is a better built camera and I would not hesitate to use adapters, large lenses. Um, I think the build quality is probably more solid. Sony has improved their lens mount. It was an issue before. I don't think it's an issue with A6500, but if I, if I had to choose one, I would choose the GH5. And then also, since you mentioned the Sigma 18 to 35, that is an awesome lens. I love that lens, and that is great to use with a speed booster. But on the A6500, you're not gonna be using it with a speed booster. You're gonna be using it with the MC11 Sigma adapter, which is $200. So you know, if you consider that price range, it's fourteen hundred plus two hundred, so sixteen hundred versus a speed booster. I think the XL is six forty nine. So there, you're looking at twenty six forty nine versus sixteen hundred. If you want to use that same lens, so to answer your question once again, um, the the body, probably the build quality, the GH five is going to be better, both with ceiling, 
um, not worrying about it breaking with drops, stuff like that. The, the Panasonic cameras are super solid. Let's look uh, with another one here. A6500 with a small HD focus in MC11 versus GH5 with Speed Booster, both with the Sigma 18 to 35. That is a great question because I was going to bring that up, and I'll, I will bring that up a little bit later, but a huge weak point is the rear LCD screen on the A6500. That small HD focus has been awesome. We've been testing it out. Um, so which one would you choose? Well, I really like the Sony's, and I really like that display, not because it's just easier to see, but you get the extra features that are built into it. It's nice to have a little bit larger screen. You regain that headphone output if you want to monitor. Price-wise, I think it's still che it's cheaper to get the Sony with that system, and it works well, but there's, there's something to be said about having a single camera that can do everything without having extra attachments and stuff that you have to bring along and worry about. So um, that's hard. Which one would I choose? Mm, I'll, we'll talk about that more on the video side. But that does definitely help the Sony camera. And it, uh, it still costs less money than that. Image quality-wise, you'll still probably video be slightly better off with the Sony. But do you want to deal with that extra stuff on top, having to remember to, to take that with you? Or you could just grab the GH5 and go. Let's do one more. Okay, this is going to be an easy one. Uh, Vlog L versus S-Log2, which is better for dynamic range. We were actually planning to shoot that today. It's, then it's really overcast, so we haven't been able to do that. But if you're subscribed to the channel, you will see that shortly on our channel. I don't want to say anything until I actually test it myself and can give you an honest answer with proof. Um, I think the actual dynamic range ratings from... Uh, the manufacturers, the Sony rates it higher than Panasonic does, uh, but there are variances, and there's also things like noise floor. Uh, you can get more overall dynamic range, but if it's more noisier where your subject is, that could be a problem. So, all right, let's move on to the next section. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of each camera. We're going to start with the GH5, and there are some really, really, really strong GH5 pros um, that are on here that really make it a really compelling camera. That's a lot of release. First off, 4K60. There's nothing in this price point that does 4K60, not even close. Probably the closest thing is, you know, a hybrid camera-wise, like the 1DX Mark II, which is $6,000 and also shoots in the terrible motion JPEG codec. Um, so if you need 4K60, you, you like to shoot 4K, you, you want that 60 FPS to slow down, which is awesome, um, you have to go with this camera. You know, the, the Sony will only let you do uh, 4K up to 30, and with a slight crop when you go into that 30 mode. Since we're mentioning 4K 60, I want to mention 1080p slow motion. Now, uh, the Panasonic will do up to 180 FPS in 1080p. The Sony will do 120. So it kind of seems like the Panasonic will, is better in that kind of that regard, but the 180 does not look as good. It, there's a quite a bit of a notice, noticeable difference between the 120 FPS, uh, the GH5 at 120 1080p, and 180. So yes, they're giving you a higher speed, and um, if you really need it, you can use that, but personally, I would not. I think the image quality is much better at 120, so I would limit myself to using 120. Just like with the GH4, I limited myself to using the 108060, not the 96, because the quality difference was really noticeable. It almost looked like 720p upscaled. Um, so they're giving you more options. And a lot of cameras do this. A lot of cameras will let you go up to like 480, but it looks terrible, so you wouldn't really use it. Now, another big difference is with the Panasonic, uh, when you're shooting that 120 or 180 or any of the variable codecs, you do not have any audio recorded and you lose any manual focus or you lose any autofocus functionality. So um, you don't need, not talking about continuous autofocus, but you can't like touch to focus or have it preset focus. Uh, you're, you're stuck with strictly manual. Now on the Sony side, the 120 FPS 1080p looks really good and you still have full, really good autofocusing for continuous autofocus and uh, using it to like preset your focus. And you also have full audio, which is really good. It's nice to be able to shoot something in 120 like sports and have full audio if you want to hear kind of what's going on and be able to select which chunk you want to slow down. 
So on the slow motion side, with 1080, I would give the win to the A6500. Um, that, the, having that audio there and then choosing what you want to slow down is really nice for me personally. And if you want to do 4K slow motion, obviously that's a win to the GH5. And that does have full audio, uh, video autofocus, everything else. The next thing is a flip around screen. I wish every camera company would give you a flip around screen. Now, it's great to be able to shoot vlogs, to shoot yourself on YouTube like right now, to see your framing, make sure it's recording. And the other thing is you're able to flip that screen and actually close it and protect the rear LCD. I've seen so many Sony cameras with the rear LCD scratched up really bad. One thing, I don't think they're just very durable, as durable as the Panasonic's, but you don't have the option to flip it and close it and keep it safe when you're traveling, when you throw it in your bag, stuff like that. So it's just such a huge convenience factor, and this is why a lot of people are choosing the Panasonics uh, or even some Canon cameras instead of the Sony. So big, big kind of a improvement there or a big pro to the GH5. Next thing is 10-bit recording. So this is also one of the only cameras in this price, board, price point or even the only camera anywhere close that's going to give you 10-bit internal. Now, I do want to mention most people do not need 10-bit. When do you need 10-bit? Well, if you're going to be doing like green screen work, it's nice to do. If you're going to be shooting vlog with a lot of gradations, like a lot of skies or certain lighting, it's really nice to have that as well. But when you put it up on YouTube, most likely you're still going to get banding there. Um, so most people don't need it, and I don't shoot with it. I'm always in the 8-bit because for most things, it works just fine. But if you do need that, then uh, go with the GH5. You also have 10-bit output, even at 4K60 on the GH5, which all, where all the Sonys are only 8-bit. Next thing, on top, well, in addition to that flip-out LCD, we have a bright LCD screen. Uh, you can actually use it outside in the sun, whereas the A6500, you cannot use outside. And it's also sharper when you're recording video. So if you're manual focusing, it's easier to tell what is sharp, what is in focus, compared to the A6500, which is not only very reflective, very dim, and almost unusable outside, or really unusable outside, uh, it's also not as detailed, so it's hard to tell what is actually in focus. Now, of course, the camera does cost less. It is $1,400, so for another $500, you can add that small HD focus, which I am really, really enjoying. I'm very excited about, and that really solves kind of both of those issues along with flipping out to see your framing, but that's another additional thing you have to add on. Next thing is rolling shutter. So GH5 is much, much better on the rolling shutter. With the GH5, yes, you can notice it if you try to notice it, but in most shooting situations, you will not notice it. It's not gonna be a problem. You don't have to worry about it. On the A6500, you do have to worry about it. If you're shooting sports, you know, if, if you're shooting video for sports, not a great camera because um, you're just going to notice that rolling shutter. You can fix it in post. It is additional steps. You're going to get additional crop. It may not be perfect, but I, I just, I wouldn't want to do that. Now for the type of work that I do, studio work for YouTube videos, weddings, we're doing nice smooth motions for handheld with that IBIS. That helps out as well. So uh, for a lot of people, it won't matter. But for the people that are doing fast motion, tracking subjects that are running, you know, for sports, stuff like that, that is an issue. Uh, next here is battery life. So the GH5 battery isn't as good as the GH4. We're no longer close to four hours, but we're still over two hours, probably between you know two and a half to three hours right around there compared to one hour on the A6500. And that is a huge difference. On the, on the GH5, I can leave with one battery and not worry about it. A6500, I need to take two additional batteries with me. So that is just a very big convenience not to have to worry about that and, uh, you know, have it all set and be able to run with you know a wedding with two batteries. That is really nice to have. Next thing is headphone out. Uh, you have a headphone jack so you can monitor your audio, make sure that there's no interference, no cracking, that the mic isn't broken. Um, we've kind of learned to work around that in the Sonys, but there's times where the mic is actually broken. You see the levels, but you have you know other noise in the background. So another kind of more pro feature that is very nice to have in the GH5 overall is a more kind of a pro camera where the A6500 is still a lot more on the consumer side because of these things. And an additional to that pro side is dual card slots. You can record and have a backup, or you can, you know, if you're doing a long, um, like a trade show or a long talk, you can actually switch over to the next card and record to that. So another pro feature, if you're worried about losing your data and a card corrupting, 
uh, you can do the backup on the GH5, which is really, really nice to have. Waveforms and vector scope in the camera. So this is new for the GH5. I don't use uh, vector scope, so waveforms are really nice to have. Um, and then a much better Wi-Fi app. So if you want to use Wi-Fi, you want to see the image from a distance on your phone, you want to be able to touch to focus, uh, you have way more, it, it's more stable, it's less kind of a delay, and you have way more options on the Wi-Fi app than you do on the Sony. All right, I need to catch my breath. I'm going off, uh, going off there. So uh, let's look at a few more questions. Thank you guys for putting your questions. Um, the GH5 seems to have much better detail than the A6500 and 1080. What can you say about it, Spasiba? So um, Mr. Pashi, hopefully I'm saying that right. Um, yes, that's true. That has always been true. The Panasonic, their, their 1080, um, their sensor uh, scaling or the way they read out the sensor and process that data into 1080p has always been much better than Canon, than Sony, and then other brands. Previously, they had a smaller sensor, so they're using less of the sensor. So for example, from 12 megapixels, they're bringing it down 1.8, where the Sony's, like the A6000, was going from 24 megapixels down to 1.9 or whatever it is for 1080. So they have to throw away and process a lot more data. Um, so I think it's the amount of data it's processing, and on top of that, the, the way they're doing it. I think they have more experience with it. So if you're shooting 1080, you're gonna get a better image from the GH5. Uh, next is high bit rate 10-bit 10, 10 4224 GH5 out. Okay, is the high bit rate 10-bit 4224 for the GH5 out yet and does it make a real difference? No, it is not out yet. Um, I believe maybe Photo Joseph can chime in here. I believe we still have another month or two for that. I could be wrong. It is going to be out soon. Um, is it going to make a difference? Now, image quality wise, I do not think that it will make a difference because the way that codec works, instead of ch just storing the changes between frames, it actually is like a, a still image each, each uh, 24 or you know 30 frames in a second. So it needs a lot more data to create that. So uh, because it's 400 compared to uh, you know 100 or 150, uh, it needs that extra data. You're not going to get extra detail from that. Now, is it going to be better? Is it going to make a difference? Well, in your editing, that should make a difference because uh, when your computer can just read all these single images, it's a lot easier for the processing compared to reading a first image and doing a ton of math to not actually looking at photos in a video, but it's just reading the difference, having to do all that calculation. So if you're having a tough time editing footage, that is where it's going to make a difference for you. So it's a trade-off you know, file size versus how easy it is to edit. Let's do one more, and uh, then we'll, we'll go on to the next section, the pros of the A6500. So we have, um, so Walter is asking, hey Max, what do you think of the Sony 16 to 70 millimeter F4 lens for video? I haven't bought that lens, and I'm not gonna buy that lens. Um, it's a good range to use, definitely, you know, you're looking at like a, uh, 24 to uh, you know just over 100 uh, you know it's a nice usable range from wide to long for most people that it's gonna work but the price it is a pricey lens and it's not super sharp um, so we have the thing that makes it more difficult for me is we have that 18 to 105 which is a longer range it's also an f4 the power zoom and I think that sells for about five to six hundred dollars versus the 16 to 70, which is about $1,000. They're both F4s. And um, one of the ones is power zoom, which I don't really zoom while recording. Uh, some people do like to have that. And sharpness wise, they're very similar. So I have a hard time paying that much more money for a lens that has less range um, and is similar sharpness when both, le both lenses being an F4. It is, the 16 to 70 is smaller and I have shot some different stuff with it. So if you wanna see what I shot with it, check out Sony, uh, competition winner max maybe YouTube search that and you'll find a video it's a two-minute video a lot of the shots are with that lens and it looks pretty good but um, you know the money factor so I do care about money if money doesn't matter pick it up it's a good lens but for that money I personally would not buy it okay guys so let's move on to the next section e6500 pros so starting off autofocus we, we've touched on this so much, and I do have to mention it. 
If you want to use autofocus for gimbal work, so I'm talking about continuous autofocus for gimbal work, uh, even like for vlogging, even though you can't see the, the screen, um, for whatever type of shooting for interviews where you have a subject moving in and out and you want shallow depth of field, you know, you could stop down to like an F4 and if they move back and forth like this, it won't matter. But if you want to have a nice blurred out background at F1.8 or F1.4, the Sony is going to keep up perfectly. It's not going to hunt to the background. The face tracking works superb. Like it just works so well and I could trust it. That's kind of the main thing, which the Panasonic, it, it's not anywhere close to that, and I can't trust it enough to use it. And the Sony, it's, it's crazy how, how good it works. So if autofocus is something you need, continuous autofocus for video, and I want to say for video because for photo, the GH5 does really, really well, um, the, the Sony is a clear winner. Uh, next thing is low light. So we have a sensor that is roughly twice the surface area, and uh, the low light is much better. So for the Sony, I don't have to worry about high ISO. If I need to go to 3200, I don't have to worry about it. And personally, I'm, I'm comfortable using the A6500 or the A6300 up to 6400 ISO. The GH5, this, so this is kind of my personal noise tolerance, is 1600 ISO is kind of where I want to cap it at. So we have quite a bit of a difference there. Um, so 6400, I almost never have to use it. Maybe a few times at a wedding, it's super dark. The sun went down already, and we don't have any sort of lighting, and I'll have to go up to 6400 with you know F1.8 glass. But that is incredibly rare. Typically, 3200 is the highest I need to go. So it, the low light is a non-issue for me on that camera. The GH5, it is... A bit of an issue because I do have to go up to 3200 somewhat regularly in those kind of wedding situations. So if you shoot, you know, if you don't ever go up above 1600, it's not going to matter for you. But you know, this is a win with the Sony. You have about two stops extra there to play with without worrying. And people's noise tolerances are different. Some people are going to say, "Oh, I can shoot the GH5 up to 12,800. It works great, and it may work great for them." Some people are going to say, "No way, I'm not going to shoot above 800." Uh, so that is really how much noise you're willing to take, where that file is going. Are you downsampling the 1080? But like I said, the A6500 wins in that range. Now, next is dynamic range. So this is basically how much, how much the, the, the difference between shadows and the highlights. The highest, bright, brightest parts, which is typically like uh, the sky, and then what's in the shadow. So the Sony is better here. Um, so we're going to take a look at S-Log. There's going to be a video S-Log versus V-Log on our channel soon, so make sure you guys check that out. But even in the standard picture profiles, the Panasonic is you know, on the level of cameras that were coming out two, three, four years ago. I'm talking about like the 5D Mark II. It is a little bit better than the 5D Mark, Mark II or III, but it's not amazing. So using standard picture profiles, if you don't want to shoot log, um, the Sony is definitely better. And uh, one thing, one way I really notice this is shooting weddings where we're in midday, there's really harsh sun, shadows and highlights. The bride is walking from the shadows into the sun, back into the, you know, where there's shade from trees, and it is terrible. And shooting Canon back in the day, it, that's a nightmare. It's going to look horrible. With the Sonys, I can pull down the highlights, push up the midtones, add a little bit of contrast back in, and it is crazy how good the image looks. Yes, it's not as good as our eyes, but it is perfectly usable. And I don't have to like start sweating when I'm in that situation anymore um, because it just, it, it looks so good. So dynamic range, the A6500 is better. Um, the Panasonic, personally, I think it did improve over the GH4. I know Panasonic said they, had, they didn't try to improve it and it's not much improved, but I am seeing uh, a better dynamic range from what I've used. At least that's what it kind of seems like. S-Log, so now we're talking about dynamic range. S-Log is included in the camera for $1,400, where the Panasonic, the camera is two grand, and you have to pay another $100 for V-Log. And then you also have to buy it. You can't just buy it in camera or online. You have to buy it from a retailer. It could get back-ordered. When I first got my GH5, I didn't have V-Log because it was back-ordered. I bought it, and then other people are complaining because it's back-ordered again. So it's kind of a big inconvenience, but you also have to pay more, which the Sony has it included, which is very nice. Proxy recording. A lot of people don't know about this. Uh, with proxy recording, you can basically you can shoot 4K, and then it can make a smaller, it's either 720 or 1080 um, 
I know for 1080, it does a 720. I'm not sure if you're, if you're doing 4K what it does, but basically it's gonna create two different files on your card. So if you have a slow computer, you don't have to wait to make proxies in your computer, wait for hours to get smooth editing. You can take both of those files, start your project with the proxy 720p files, edit it nice and smoothly, do everything you need, and then reconnect, uh, relink the full res files, and then export that. So that is so nice to have built into the camera. If you have a slow old computer or you're editing on a laptop, it's just a big convenience factor where a lot of people on the GH5 are complaining about Premiere crashing, 10-bit not working, or slow performance. So you have to keep in mind that 4K is literally four times the pixels of 1080p. Almost like you know, editing four 1080p files on the screen at the same time. So it takes a lot more performance. Um, I advocate spend the money on a good computer. Computer prices have went way down because if you're spending thousands and thousands and thousands on lenses, cameras, everything else, lighting, but you have a thousand dollar old computer and you spend more time editing than you do actually shooting, it just that doesn't make sense. But proxy files are really nice to have. Other thing is preamps. So the GH5 has really good preamps. Panasonic has done really good over the years, but the Sony is on you know, a step above. So if you're recording audio internally into the camera, it sounds really good compared to other cameras. Now before shooting with the Sony, I always recorded my audio externally and I would reconnect and relink. Since getting the Sony, I've started shooting audio internally because the audio, the preamps for the audio are really good, nice and clean, low noise floor. So I'm happy enough with the audio quality to shoot internally. So that's a positive for me. Um, last thing on here for the Sony is USB charging. GH5 does have USB Type-C, which is a very capable connector. You can do so much with that, but it does not allow the camera to charge with uh, USB-C. Now this is very handy if you're shooting, let's say, time lapses, you wanna plug in a power bank and not worry and shoot for 10 hours. Um, or if you're on the road and you can plug in a power bank or plug it into your car or your cell phone charger to, can, to charge up the camera. There's just a lot of conveniences and I didn't really notice how much I use this until I got the GH5 and when a situation where I wanna juice up a little bit more and I don't have the convenience. So that would have been nice to have. And some of the other Panasonic cameras do have this. So like the GX85, it doesn't even come with a charger. It just comes with a wall USB charger. And you can't, uh, for that camera, you can't record and charge at the same time as you can on the A6500. Uh, but uh, you do have the ability to charge. Where on the Sony, you can even be recording, plug in a USB power bank, and that's gonna extend your shooting time uh, because it's taking juice from the battery and from the USB power bank. So that is a big convenience. So looking over my pros and cons list, the GH5 has more pros on it. So there's more things that help it stand out. It is a more pro body, it is more reliable. When I did a shoot for the, the US Air Force, we did a kind of video tutorial shoot for a couple weeks. It was over 100 degrees outside, like 104, kind of that temperature. And I, I left my cameras. I took the GH4 because I knew it's not gonna overheat. It's just gonna work. And it did not fail. And the direct sun for 12 hours a day, multiple days, it just, it works. So if you just need a camera that works, you don't wanna work with quirks, worry about overheating, battery life, the GH5 is just gonna work. If you're willing to put in more work, deal with some of the ergonomics issues, the A6500 can give you a better image overall. So those are my pros and cons. Hopefully that helped you guys uh, select a camera. Uh, right now I have both. We'll see what happens going into the future. Um, time for Q&A. Recommended for daylight, daytime, time-lapse of architecture. A6500 would be my recommendation. You have a larger sensor. You have better sensor dynamic range for images if you're going to be um, editing those and um, just better image quality for photos. Not that GH5 can't do it. I mean, you can get usable results, really good work from either of these cameras. I mean, we're so spoiled with the technology, but my choice would be the A6500. Okay, super wide lenses, what is your choice? So you have uh, the Sony, like you mentioned here, 10 to 18 f4. I have that lens. I really like that lens. I wish it wasn't an f4, um, but it's fairly small and um, very usable. The Lumix 7 to 14 2.8. Now I'm pretty sure that the Sony costs less. I think the Sony is about uh, about $800, which is not cheap. I, it should be less than that, honestly. Um, but when you don't have a lot of lens options, you can kind of charge a lot of money. So let me see what the 7 to 14 
2.8 is. I would bet this thing is about a thousand bucks or so. Ooh, 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 yes. Twelve hundred dollars. This is the this is the Olympus. Let me see if I can find. I don't think I think the Panasonic might not be out yet. So okay, seven to fourteen f four is what the what the Panasonic is. Let me see the price on here. See, when you're shooting wide, almost everything is in focus anyway, so that really doesn't matter. What does matter if you're shooting in low light conditions and you're on an f four shooting with the GH5, you're gonna be going up to 64, at least in my conditions, like a wedding, you're gonna be going up to 6,400, and that just does not look good. So it looks like we have a B&H, 800 bucks. So price-wise, they're about similar. See, I have not used a 7 to 14 F4. Um, looks like it has good reviews on it. And so it's a 14 to 28 range, so I believe that is, you know, it's slightly wider. And it's an F4. So price-wise, they're the same. I mean, whatever system you have, you get that lens. But if you want to shoot really wide, um, I say the 6500, especially for a video, is going to be easier to use with the F4 because if you're shooting at 6400, you'll still get a decent image where the GH5 shooting at 6400 ISO video, not great. Okay. Uh, when you shoot 120 FPS on the A6500, can you set it to be a regular file instead of slow-mo in camera? Yes. Uh, as far as I know, the default is for it to be a regular file. So, um, so if you shoot for one minute, you still have a one-minute clip. You have full audio. You can scrub through it. You can use your autofocus. <clears throat> and then you select which part you want to slow down and slow down that little chunk. I prefer that instead of having you know, uh, something that's already conformed in camera because then you have this long file. You have way more to search for to find what you need to find. That's my preference. And then you also, you have the audio in there. So, yep, that's exactly what you could do in the A6500. For photography purposes, um, A6500 or the GH5, I mentioned that in the beginning of the video. I do prefer the Sony. So if you join this later, uh, once this is posted on YouTube, which should be shortly, shortly after we finish this, as soon as YouTube processes it, you guys can go back and check the beginning of the video. Hey Max, do I need an external monitor for the A6500 for shooting outdoor street interviews and daylight with a shoulder rig? Yes, you definitely need an external monitor. The small HD focus is probably the best bang for the buck, and we're gonna have a video on that shortly. But yeah, the rear LCD screen is really, really difficult to use. I've learned to use it, but it's a struggle and it's a huge pain. What do you think about the 35 mil 1.8 lens for that purpose? That is a great lens. Um, is a very nice lens. If you're shooting with a6500, I would take a look at the Sigma 30 mil 1.4. It is sharper. It is a 1.4, and it does not have image stabilization built in, but you do have the IBIS. So I would probably lean towards the Sigma because of uh, it's a little bit less expensive and the sharpness. Um, so either one of those lenses would be great for you. Let's see if I can find a GH5 question. Can you use a GH5 autofocus on the Sigma 18 to 35 with EF? Metabone Speed Booster, uh, the XL one. Is it acceptable for vlog, run, and gun shooting? So the GH5 isn't great for continuous autofocus anyways, and when you throw an adapter on, it's gonna be worse. So you can pre-focus with it. So if you wanna, um, you know, touch to focus or do, you know, just do a single autofocusing, have it set the focus and then run with that. Make sure you keep the distance between your subject. That will work, but if you wanna get good usable continuous autofocus with that lens, I would say no. And for vlogging, I would not recommend a GH5 with the 18 to 35 and a speed booster for vlogging. If you're gonna be holding it out and recording yourself, that's gonna be a pain. That's gonna be very heavy, and you're gonna get tired very quickly with that. What about graded difference between 8-bit Sony versus Panny 10-bit after you've graded? I haven't done a lot. The few time, the few things I have tested with it, honestly, I did not see a difference. 10-bit Panasonic, 8-bit A6500, I did not see a difference. I'm not a master color grader. I still have a lot of room for improvement in there, so I would look at people who are good at color grading, see what videos they come out with. But you, the 10-bit is really useful, like I said, if you're doing green screen work, if you're doing effects work, or if you wanna avoid banding. And for most things, you don't get banding with the Sonys, especially if you're not using uh, like S-Log. Uh, even then with S-Log, it's not very often that you would get banding. So I would not say there's a difference there. So what lens would you recommend for street photography at night? City, low light, 
for the GH5. Um, I would look at the fast lenses. If you can afford the 42.5 f1.2, you can get some really nice bokeh with that lens, but it's expensive. The 1.7 is a great alternative. If you guys are interested in that, I actually have a video comparing the Noctocron with the f1.7 version and the 85mm 1.8 Olympus lens on my channel I did about a year, year and a half ago. So um, personally, if you don't have a lot of money, I would stick with the primes. They have a 25 1.7 prime and then the 42.5 1.7 prime. And then for wide, I really like the Rokinon 12 millimeter F2. It's nice and sharp, it's very small. It is manual, but when you're shooting that wide, it's very easy to manual focus. So I would just get those three lenses. Um, of course, you could do like a 12 to 35 to 8, which I have and I like, but you're not going to get very much depth of field, especially on the wider end. So my preference for street photography is some primes. Can the GH5 record proxies in camera? No, it cannot. Um, are they going to fix the autofocus on the GH5? I don't think it's ever going to get to the level of the Sony because it is not phase detection, but I do expect it to be improved. I have used other cameras like the X-T20, which has quite good continuous autofocusing and is contrast-based as well in 4K. Um, so I do expect them to improve that. The Viking cams um, said the high bit 1080. Okay, so we answered that question already. Which camera is more future-proof? Which camera can give the best file size? Well, the standard 4K files, they're all 100 megabit per second, so there's no difference there. Which camera is more future-proof? I would say the GH5. You have a lot more features to play with. You have anamorphic to play with. Um, you have really good durability, usability. Um, the GH4s are still selling well on the used market. Um, so as a more flexible platform, I think the GH5 is it. What all-around lens would you recommend for the A6500? I love my Sigma 18 to 35, and then you also get like the $300 50 to 51.8 1, for you know it's inexpensive, and that's a great combo. It is a little heavy on that lens. If you just want something that is a good lens with a good zoom ratio, there is the 18 to 105 f4 for about five to six hundred bucks. You're not gonna get super shallow depth of field with that, but it is a good all-around lens. It's fairly sharp and it's well-priced. We don't have any 2.8 zooms, unfortunately. And let's see, thoughts are regarding color rendition. Uh, it's a preference. Most people prefer the Panasonic. Um, so, and most people agree that Panasonic has better colors. Of course, you could tweak everything, adjust it, use LUTs. I use LUTs at really small percentages. Um, I don't just ever throw a LUT on. I'll do it at like 30% or something like that. So Panasonic is mostly the best regarded uh, for color. And wow, this has been a long time. <laughs> this is what I didn't want to do, have a very, very long video. Uh, recording live events such as conferences and gigs. If you don't have super low light conditions, the GH5 is definitely the win because you have a much better battery life and you don't have a recording limit, which is something I didn't mention earlier, so I'm glad this question was brought up. You don't have that 30 minute recording limit, you can record unlimited. If you have a power connect, you can record for eight hours, it'll switch over to another card, so definitely the GH5. All right guys, I think that's gonna be it for questions. So in conclusion, the GH5 is a more capable more durable, better all-around camera that you can rely on. The Sony has some strong advantages that are still gonna pull people uh, to it, like the continuous autofocus, better low light, better photo capability, a lot more flexible with photos um, and dynamic range and overall image quality for photo and video. The GH5 is getting closer to the Sony now, but the Sony still wins. So it, it's kind of your choice. If you guys joined us later, you guys can go back and watch this uh, full video where I talk about all the pros and cons and some other things about these cameras. Let's go ahead and open up 241. Not bad. We still have people here. Um, I'm going to dig through the comments and answer a few more. Um, Max, would you say the GH5 is an all-around best camera? Yes, I would. It's not the best at everything, and but it is kind of like a jack-of-all-trades master of some, which is what I want to actually um, maybe name my review. <laughs> it is. It just works really well, and it gets the job done. You may not be the best in certain areas, uh, but overall, it is an excellent tool that's going to do the job right for you. Do I still live with your mom? 
<laughs> Max, do you still live with your mom? <laughs> no, I don't live. Uh, I moved out about when I got married, which is six years ago. That's when I moved out and um, I bought my own house. What would you suggest if you're shooting both stills and video? Uh, if you can deal with the quirks of the Sony, I would recommend the Sony. The difference in quality vast between the GH5 and G85? No, it is not vast. GH5 is more detailed, it's sharper, maybe slightly better dynamic range. But for the money, the GH5 and the G7 are really good cameras, and I still recommend the G7 for people who are just starting out. My camera is too loud for my mic, lav mic. Are there any good lav mics with reduced sensitivity? That is an issue with the GH5. I wish it got quieter in the, the preamp so you can lower it down. Um, the camera is well. Uh, I li really like the, wire, the Rode Smart Lav. You can actually boost the signal and lower the signal. So if you can afford that and you want wireless, I would do that. Um, as of, you know, if you're just using a lav, um, I would look into the Aperture um, A Lav, I think they call it. It comes with some accessories, about 40 bucks, but just right Aperture Lav that does have a lower sensitivity than some of the other mics I've used. And it is, you know, pretty good for the money. If Sony, uh, so Nathan says, it's a Sony, don't worry about pushing your ISOs. Exactly. Do you think we'll see an A7S Mark III this summer? I do think so, and I really hope so. How's the autofocus with the 18 to 35 one on the A6500? For video, it's not great. It is okay, but it just moves back and forth quite often, and there is a decent amount of noise, which is not good. Okay, so let me go up here. 100 likes. Thank you guys for the likes. Um, if you guys are watching right now, um, I see it's 248. If you haven't hit that like button, go ahead and, and smash that like button right now. And thank you guys for joining. Okay, set of two and three lenses for the A6500. Sure, this is what I use. The Sigma 18 to, 18 to 35 one with the Sigma adapter, which they just lower the price on. Uh, the 50 1.8 OSS lens, or if you don't want that lens, you can uh, do the 85 1.8, which is new and it's better, but it costs more money. So that's kind of like a longer lens. Use the um, the clear image zoom if you want to get a little bit longer and get yourself something wider like the 10 to 18 if you need it. Uh, Kodak is much better than the Sony. Sony compression is pretty rough when compared to Panasonic. I have not seen that. And let's see. If I can't find anything else that's new, I, we're going to finish this off. Max, if you can only have one lens for the A6500, which one would it be? For filmmaking, I would go with the 18 to 35. Um, you're not going to get good video autofocus, but it is a very sharp, good lens for what I do. I shot a ton of weddings without ever having to go to 6400 or even 3200 or even 1600. Sounds like you're lighting your stuff or you live in a place where there's not a lot of low lit receptions or ceremonies um, or something like that. So if you're shooting with 2.8 lenses, 3200 I use fairly often when the sun goes down or a very low lit situation. So that's really nice for you. If, if you don't have to go above 1600, the GH5 is a great tool. Uh, what do you think about the EOS HD Pro for the Sony on the A6500? I did buy that. I played around with it. I didn't love it, and I'm not using it right now, but I need to look more into it. All right, guys, we're going to finish this off. Um, I'm seeing more likes on this video. Thank you, guys. There's still 222 of you guys, so if you have not hit that like button, hit that like button so more people are going to see this video after. Thank you guys for joining us. We want to do more live videos, and we want to improve the video quality, get an actual nice camera and an XLR mic hooked up. And if you guys keep watching and you guys enjoy this video, we'll make more of them, and hopefully next time it's going to be shorter than this one. That is the hard thing is to keep these live videos uh, shown. So, okay, last one, and I, uh, David, I have to answer your question. <laughs> Should I trade in my 12 to 16 Leica for 12 to 35 version one or two? I would only do it if you want shallower depth of field, if you're running into the aperture issue, or if you're running into, you know, having to raise your ISOs too high. Um, personally, I mean, if you haven't seen my video on that, check out my video on that. But I would prefer having a 12 to, th 12 to 35. Um, I have the version one, I'm very happy with that one and like a 42.5 f1.7 for the long shots. Two lenses, and it will get the job done. 
All right, guys. So wait, which I keep seeing questions. I need to hide those. <laughs> uh, 12, which is uh, weight, which 18 to 35. Uh, the Sigma 18 to 35 1.8, it's an awesome lens. So if you ever hear somebody mentioning um, you know, 18 to 35, it's always the Sigma 18 to 35 1.8. Thank you guys for joining me. I definitely appreciate it. It was great seeing you guys. It was great seeing the questions. And uh, I will see you guys in the next video.